Hello and welcome to the fresh start that is part two of the Battle of the Atlantic. Hopefully, this will all work. Hopefully, I'll be able to make my jokes about the fact that I'm wearing a Seahawk t-shirt, which is about uh, from our Air Seahawk from the time when we actually had a space down at HM RNAS Cold Rose and HMS Seahawk, then you could watch aircraft before someone in the museums decided it didn't make enough money, despite being amazing for people who were interested. Um, you know, and being mostly run by volunteers. Can't think why they don't employ me in those, in those museums. I cannot think why. Or actually, even when I volunteered for things, they don't get back to me, so you know. You know. Right end, so it's on the sloops, and hopefully sloops will have a lot more success than corvettes. Certainly I have sitting, waiting, ready, already, my little book on sloops. My little sloop book. And... My other sloop book. Or as I call them, modified bitterns. We'll see why in a second. So, sloops. What well, if I just press that's caused the noise to come from a new thing? I'm not sure, but let's see. A. Let's make sure this is on silent. B. Let's press N. Yay! Bilge pumps! Okay, yes, as I said, in the first one, there is a reason there is links for the bilge pumps for the Discord and for Patreon and all the other things below because. Bilge Pumps is cool. Bilge Pumps, I want you to hear more about. I'm supposed to be doing more advertising for. Because it is really good. And it's something which I'm really proud of. I'm really proud to be involved with it. With Drac. With Jamie from Armored Carriers. I'm really proud to be taking part of it. And I'm really enjoying it. And a lot of people are. Other people are. This is another one of the um, memes. From the Bilge Pump memes part of my Discord. Fun times. <laughs> Right then, in. So, Battle of the Atlantic. Right, uh, right. I know the first video, part one, felt a bit rushed to me. Mainly because the planned ideas I had for it were about 45 minutes worth, and it ends up being about 20 minutes worth because I'm worried about it not working. So, I'm hoping this is going to work as I've now got everything working. And therefore, I can refer this full length. So, I've added this slide back in the Battle of the Atlantic overview. It's a long war, the Battle of the Atlantic, and its context. We're going to be talking about some of the context as time goes on, but you have to remember that with the fall of France, the loss of Norway, there is a huge impact on the Battle of the Atlantic. And both take place in this time, right? It's humongous. This is anti-submarine warfare, right? These are the shipping sunk by U-boats in the Atlantic. You've got the first happy time and the second happy time. Even with the issues they're having with torpedoes, you look at the number of kills they're having, but also you look at where they're taking place. It's basically the First World War all over again in the first three panels. It's the same area. All around the UK. You look as time goes on, where it moves to. Where the issues come. And how anti submarine warfare evolves. France is key. France is key. It moves their bases 450 miles, but also means that they don't have to go around the whole of the United Kingdom to get out. So if you have control of France, the Channel is always a barrier. Channel's always going to be a barrier, but the geography of the Battle of the Atlantic is this. If you have control of Norway, and you're able to do a Norway barrier with the UK, or at least a very pro-neutral Norway, so you can do a barrier along that sort of thing, you can stop 
a lot of ships going out, submarines going out that way. But if you can, and then if you can control the English Channel, and which the British could do, even if with the fall of France, there were still mines, it's still fairly shallow. It's not exactly a good place for submarines to go. So if you can control Norway, you can stop the submarines getting out into the Atlantic. But once those submarines have got out into the Atlantic, if they don't have to go back through there, through the North Sea, if they once they're beyond the North Atlantic, they can go down to France. They can operate beyond the from the uh, from the French ports. Then there is a huge advantage for them in fuel, in time on station, and time getting to station, in all sorts of things. France is critical. So if either of these hadn't fallen, if France hadn't fallen, then of course those bases wouldn't be available, and even with the control of Norway, the Germans would still be fighting for, uh, fighting from back the other side of the North Sea. So they would still have that limitation on their operations. But if Norway hadn't fallen, if Norway hadn't been lost, then the Germans have to run a gauntlet far more to get out into the North Atlantic. Even if they're operating from France, there's all that sort of issues. And then for the Arctic convoys and all those convoys up there, there is a lot more safety. So geography has a big impact on where the submarines are a threat and what's in play. It's a tough war. It's a very tough war. So we're talking about sloops today. And I've just realized that text is massively small. So I'm going to do something for you. I'm going to do this. Bye-bye. And I'm going to do this. And I'm going to talk to you about this stuff. And hopefully it's going to stay working. Not sure why it decided to reset when I expanded it, but we'll leave that to where. So what I want you to think about is that not just Article 8 of the 1930 London Naval Treaty, but also what sloops are doing, what their conversions are, what their roles are. They're doing minesweeping, anti-submarine. They are commander-in-chief's flagships. They are HMS Enchantress is the whole Royal Navy sort of the Admiralty yacht, which is a, sort of the Admiralty flagship in many regards. They are mine layers. Some of them will be air defense ships in World War II. They have a tremendous number of roles. This all comes from two pages in that little blue book, and it's just colossal to come with the changes they're doing. But also think about that. This is one of the reasons why I want to get into sloops and why it's going to be my next project once I'm through the tribals, battles and darings. And, you know, once I've got my PhD thesis converted into a book and I've got that um, edited volume of Falklands Malvinas Wars um, war uh, sort of thing done from the conference with my girlfriend. Uh, once we got that sort of done, this is my next big project, which I'm going to start churning stuff out on. I'm going to start writing on, researching it now. And it's it's amazing the roles sloops get up to. And sloops are in many ways critical because we did corvettes in the first one because they are understood. They are known and flowers are often talked about as the ships of the Battle Atlantic. But really... In the beginning of the war, it's the sloops. And the whole way through this war, it's the sloops which set the tone for the Battle of the Atlantic for the Escort Convoy War. It's their, their capabilities which are being replicated in other ships. It's their skills, their abilities which are being designed and are wanted. 
Right then. Boogaloo boo. I'm back. I wasn't going to let you have the whole time without me. You might have too much fun. Right on. Let's go. Bitten class. HMS Enchantress, which was originally HMS Bitten, and is pictured there. HMS Stork and HMS Bitten, which was the second one, actually, in service. Um... <laughs> Just noticed Bitten hasn't been metallicized. They have a range of systems. They have a range of weapons, and they're really rather good, and rather good looking. They are, as you can see, 1,190 tons standard displacement. Um... They have all sorts of weaponry fitted. And I'm just getting it up now. This book is kind of interesting. This, it's a very cool book. Um, it's Arnold Haig's Sloops. It's very interesting. It's, um, it's sometimes a little bit muddled to find stuff in, but it is interesting. So, same figures of displacement. Um, Bitten was completed with the revised armament of three twin four inch uh, high angle mountings and a quadruple uh, 0 0.5 machine inch machine gun. Bitten would be lost, and I'll discuss that later in the war. She was actually lost in Norway. So not only did we lose the geography of Norway, we lost actually excellent sloops in Norway. They were all quickly fitted to carry various systems as AA ships and as no, not just as AA ships, but as. As anti submarine ships, as all sorts of things. <sighs> Sorry, I, I spent the day reading up the story of these little ships, and they just, there's just so much going through my head. This slide's better, though. And yes, I know for Stork it's a little bit repetitive, but that's because Stork's story in the beginning is one thing, and it's the basic story, and that's what you can find online in many respects, is this story of her. And then once I did digging in books, it's the, you know it's the bottom of the um, the bullet points. Stork, despite being completed as a survey ship, would return to the UK from Malaya just prior to World War Two within ten days of war. Within ten days, war being declared, she emerges as a fully capable anti-air sloop. She would escort convoys throughout the war, survive being torpedoed, uh, torpedoed by U seventy seven. And then gets revenge for having lost her bow, rather Eskimo-ish. But she lost it to a torpedo, again, like Eskimo did. Um, by sinking U-634. Takes part in Normandy and the Mediterranean. Was just refitting for the Pacific when war ended. And would eventually serve out her service in command of the Fishery Protection Squadron. They're such cute little ships. Most interesting thing I found out recently in my research is that the Indian vessels, um, Jumna, Sudle, Godavari, and Nabara, are always talked about. If you read everywhere, most places they're talked about as being sl black swan sloops. But if you look them up in some of the books, etc., they're referred to as modified bittens. Which is rather cute, because basically a, a black swan sloop is a modified bitten. So we always, the black swan class are these, this famous class, this wonderful class of sloops which are so well known. Not mainly because of two of their members, HMS Starling and HMS Amethyst. One of course, we'll, we'll discuss how both are well known later. But, 
the fact is they are a modified bitten design. And in many ways, rather like with the swordfish and certain other parts of the fleet at Royal Navy at this time, sloops are a very well, a very reliable design, in part because every single generation has been a slight modification on the one which preceded it, or at least one of the ones which preceded it. The interesting thing about Atrus Bitten, and I have a picture of her in here, with her having lost her stern, and I noticed it, and then I read it in the book and went, oh, so it's not just me seeing things. Well, that's good to know. She loses her... She loses, and I say it's in here, it's in here, but will he find it in time without looking an idiot? Probably not. He's dyslexic. Sorry. Own joke. As a dyslexic, I can make it. Anyone else does? I'll sit on you. And I'm heavy. Right now. This is HMS Bitten in Norway. Now... You're going to point out that her stern is missing, and that is why eventually the Royal Navy sink her, because they can't get her home. But actually, she looks fairly level and straight to me, so I'm wondering if sinking her was really necessary. It probably was actually because they thought they couldn't get her home and get her home safely. But, you know, if she'd been closer to home, she'd have probably survived. She'd probably taken in tow, in tow and brought back to the UK and repaired. And given a new stern. So it speaks to the toughness of these ships. These were full naval build ships. Unlike corvettes, unlike frigates to an extent, these were fully built ships. And they're cute. This is HMS Enchantress. And that's her as a yacht, as the, uh, the, the Admiralty yacht. And that's her in her war, uh, war mold. And, you know, she looks good in both. So the black swans. Right then. So compared to what we've just been over for the lovely bitten class, Slightly more, slightly heavier, ever so slightly. Put on another bit of a, um, you know, hundred to two hundred tons, depending on whether they're modified or unmodified. So it's a modified bitten, then it's a modified modified bitten, technically. They're cute ships. They're lovely ships, and you know. Then we go through them and go, right then, so we've got two shafts deploying 3,600 horsepower. Yep. That gets them a quarter of a knot extra in the originals and a full knot and a quarter on, um, well, actually, it's going to sound strange. Machinery for the Bittens is two shaft geared turbines designed for ship horsepower 3,300 ship horsepower and a total speed of 18.75 knots all made 19 knots on trial and I know again and I, I hopefully I talked about this in the earlier one but I might not have because I was rushing so basically below cruiser the further you get down below cruiser the more modified the ships get and this gets to motor torpedo boats and motor gunboats completely absurd levels but even sloops they get modified Remember, these ships were designed to be modified, as I you know, discussed at the beginning. They are designed to be altered. They are designed to be adaptable in terms of their firepower, in terms of what's going on, usually by removing X mount and putting all sorts of things in that place. But if you're already designed and given the equipment to do your own modifications built into the ship, then what other modifications might you decide to make? And this is the thing, they do. They do make modifications. Now, in many ways, the Black Swans are some of the prettiest ships built in World War II. They really are. 
But also think about this, they are far faster, at least theoretically, well actually no definitely, than any of the Corvettes. I don't think any of the Corvettes were clocked doing more than 18 knots when they really were modified and cranking it out, whereas the Black Swan sloops were all 19, 20 knots. Yes, honestly, Governor. 20 knots is my max speed. Yeah. Right. HMS Starling, under the command of Johnny Walker, would rack up 11 submarines and go sing her own glorious 1st of June. And that she's just HMS Starling I've got in here. And do I have her in here or is she in the other one? Cock or pheasant. Oh, it's in. There you go. There she is. There's Adrian like Starling. And the black swans are very, very cool. Very, very cool. You know, they have such an intricate design for such small ships, and they can do this because they are built on pond so much. Oh, it's HMS Flamingo. This one. In her chart. And because they've been built up over generations, it does enable them to have some advantages. Oh, right, let's get the ball in the camera. Now, as you can see, it's actually a very well subdivided structure with a lot of space for survival and a lot of space for engine power relatively to the sort of size of the hull, which is why they are quite so powerful and quite so maneuverable. Also, sloops were very, very good at doing the slow speed work, which was critical. And later on, they could be fitted quite easily with throwers and various other systems, because again, they were designed the whole way through to be adaptable. And this is a big part of their design and their structure. But also there's something else they have an advantage of working with. Yep. <clears throat> Audacity. So, in the beginning I talked about the joy of using a fleet carrier for anti-submarine operations. And before anyone starts going, okay, yeah, Britain is now modern navy, is an anti-submarine navy, they shouldn't have Queen Elizabeth style carriers for it well a the ships you need the things you need are bigger b it's peacetime you only get to build these sort of things in wartime because honestly if you're talking about building a carrier even for a 20 of eleven thousand tons and all it's going to take is eight or so aircraft most people will laugh you out the park in peacetime in wartime it matters because those eight or so aircraft can make a big difference in this case, they shoot down seven condors. Why is she carrying martlets? Why is she shooting martlets? Well, wildcats, but as they were called in the Royal Nailers at the time, a fleet air on martlets, but wildcats to everyone else in the world. Why is she carrying those? And by the way, one, Eric Winkle Brown, who gets a kill and gets rescued from her when she gets sunk. Why is she carrying those not anti-submarine warfare aircraft? Why is she not carrying swordfish? Because the aircraft were considered the bigger threat. The aircraft were able to guide submarines on in on the convoy. But also, they were attacking the convoys themselves. So you think you're going to have to fight a trade war. You think you're going to have to protect things at sea. 
in a trade war, you're going to need a balance of capabilities. What is interesting is that when we're talking about this modernly, and more often than not, when I'm talking about anti-submarine warfare, we're going to be talking about frigates, and that's going to be the next part. Free, we'll be looking at the frigates of World War One, the sort of the genesis of the modern frigates in many respects. But it's a whole task group formation. It's not such a simple thing. It's uh, yes, you've got an escort carrier, which might well have fighters. It might have swordfish. It might have all sorts of things, and it will have them. Because they're going to provide you with a lot of reach. It might, in modern terms, it might carry a lot of anti-submarine warfare helicopters. Or airborne early warning helicopters. Or fighters. Because it depends what threat you're facing. It's very rare that the threat you're going to be facing is going to be one-dimensional. And the threat which we haven't talked about the whole way through this is the surface radar so far. Sloops aren't for dealing with surface raiders. Corvettes aren't for dealing with surface raiders. If necessary, they will fight. Both of them, if necessary, will fight them. But they don't really expect to win against surface raiders unless they're a converted merchant ship and they catch it, you know, napping somehow. Frigates. Part 4 is where we look at what was the potential counter to surface raiders. But honestly, the real counter to surface raiders? That's destroyers. That's cruisers. That's battleships. That's the fleet carriers. Because if you build your force to counter one threat, you can guarantee the enemy will come with another. So in the books... And I have to say, I really do recommend Vice Admiral Schofield's Arctic Convoys. It's got some really cool stuff in here. Um, I especially like the drawings. I like the uh, the reality of the maps and the opposition and how they go and how it explains stuff. But I like also that there's a first-hand account running through it. And I like that it explains things like, you know, the convoy organization and the structure of your convoy. So if you consider this is PQ-18, cruising with full escort. And you've got your escorts. Where you, these are sort of your escorts around. These are your merchant ships. Your And what else you've got there? You've got an anti-aircraft ship here. You've got... All sorts of things positioned around. The boxes are the ships which were sunk by submarine attack. The circles, I'm not sure if you can see them, are ships sunk by aircraft. So this is your convoy. And this is what gets it hit. And set next time, they'd improve it. But the important point was, yes, you lost two, four, six, eight, ten merchant vessels. But two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, eighteen, twenty, twenty-two, twenty-four, twenty-six, twenty-eight, thirty got through. That's the reality of a convoy war. Not necessarily killing submarines as getting the convoys through. That's what we come coming up. Um ooh Patreon video What stuff would you put in warehouse at the end of World War One for World War Two if you were in command and why? So much stuff going in there now. 
seriously, I'm, I'm just keep making a list. I just keep going, oh, I wouldn't mind having those. Oh, I'd like those. Oh, that'd be cool. Um, looking forward to the 2nd of July's back bottom of cruisers. That's, that I do believe, is it next week? Yeah, that's next week. Oh my goodness me. And of course, pre-tribals. Mm, the A to I classes of destroyers. They're cute chips. Where to find me? Twitter, Patreon, Globe Maritime History. All links are down in the system down below. And Frigates is going to be part three. Which I haven't recorded yet. But part two has been semi-rushed, I suppose. But has still lasted 30 minutes and has so far been safe. So thank you to everyone who's watching. Thank you to all my viewers. Thank you to all my subscribers. Thank you to all my patrons. Uh, what I've decided is part one will have gone up at 10 o'clock. Part two will go up at 3 a.m. Part three will go up at 8 a.m. Part four at 1 p.m. And parts one to four will get further advertisements on the hour leading up to six o'clock. There will also be tweets that accompany them when I go out. So, hope you enjoy and thank you very much for watching. Now to go and record part three. <laughs>